All right, can everyone hear me? I'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone to the Open for Anti-Racism program. And we're just so pleased that you decided to join us this afternoon. Um, this program was piloted last year in the California Community College system, and we're just embarking on year two of the program. So much of what we'll share about today is the findings from year one. Um, and I'm Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER, and uh, thrilled to be here with my co-leaders in the project, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Thanks, Una. Hey, everybody. James Blapa Grossklag with College of the Canyons. So glad to see so many people here. And Kim, you go ahead. I'm not sure Liz is with us today. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kim Gruy. I'm actually at Northern Virginia Community College, but I live in California and I have my hands in many open education pots and happy, happy to be here. Hello, everyone. My name is Joy Shoemate. Uh, I work at College of the Canyons with James and really thrilled to be here with you all and uh, get to share a little bit about our, uh, our program with you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much to those wonderful leaders. Um, and I also wanted to mention our advisory coaches who worked with our faculty who participated last year in coaching them through their implementation of their action plans, which you'll hear more about in just a moment. And very quickly, Meritiz Apigo from a Contra Costa Community College, Dr. Alyssa Cooper from Glendale Community College in Arizona, Aloha Sargent from Cabrillo College in California, and Dr. Micah Young from Pasadena City College in California. So what we hope you'll learn today, we're going to talk a little bit about the design and the support of the program for the faculty who participated and the study findings. Um, a big part will be about the OER and open pedagogy being used as tools for anti-racism. And there's going to be some examples of the uh, projects that were put in place by our participating faculty. And then there'll be some opportunity for you to find out about resources that you can leverage uh, for your own programs uh, focused on this. And then at the very end, we'll talk about moving from the pilot to the program this year. And a big thank you to the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. They've been thought partners in addition to being the funders for this program and um, have helped us set direction, uh, not only last year, but also entering into this year. Um, and we very much appreciate that uh, input. All right, for those of you who might be new to the Community College Consortium for OER, I can see Ursula Pike right there. She probably doesn't need this tutorial, but um, she, I can only see six people on my screen at the moment. Um, the CCC OER has um, been working with community colleges around the country and also in Canada uh, for over a decade. Uh, we were founded in 2007, and we work with faculty on uh, developing OER. We work with staff. Um, we foster OER regional leadership, um, and it's all about improving student equity and success. And we're just thrilled to have you join us today. So before I get into the OFAR program, I wanted to talk a little bit about the California Community College system. So last year, we implemented this program there, and this year we are continuing in the California Community College system. Well, it is the largest higher education system in the country um, with 116 community colleges, 76 districts, probably not too surprising considering that California is quite a large state, uh, uh, both uh, geographically and population-wise. We serve over 2.1 million students per year, the majority are Hispanic serving institutions and one in every four community college students in the nation attends a California community college. So if we can have some impact here, we hope that it can uh, really um, spread. So the motivation. So last summer was a really tough time um, with the murder of George Floyd and so many other um, incidences. And it really sparked an awakening of the um, of the racism that is deeply embedded in our society and also in our educational institutions. And so um, it, there was many wonderful statements put out by educational institutions, organizations about how they were gonna fight for equality and racial justice. Um, and some of them have acted on that and you know, some have are still thinking about it. But, but in fact, the idea was what is something that faculty can do right away in their classrooms uh, because they were, they they are interested in doing that, and we we truly found that out in this program, and so 
um, we went ahead and worked with the Hewlett Foundation to launch this, and um, we had many applications for our program. And I, we have a very quick video we want to show you uh, where we have some of the participants talking about the program. Leading up to this, I have been trying to take advantage of trainings that the different schools I work at offer, like equitable grading practices and um, equitable sylla syllabi practices and curriculum and joining anti-racist task force. But I felt like what was missing was here's just some concrete steps you can use, then here's how we can help you do that. I have been doing um, equity work but way before we started talking about anti-racism in the form of anti-bias. And I, uh, I actually really like that we're calling it what it is now, anti-racism, because I think it's much more honest and transparent. The participants were in a four-week intensive asynchronous online course that Joy and I co-facilitated. And the culminating event was that for them to create an action plan for the spring 2021 semester, because the idea was to take action right now. All right. So, <laughs> whoops, this always happens to me. Stop that. I'm con <laughs> okay. So, so what faculty uh, were telling us um, after they went through that initial training period was OFAR gave them, I'm sorry, we, we, we abbreviate, OFAR gave them the starting point and, um, and the confidence to be frank and vulnerable to, to their students and to talk about race and privilege in the classroom. And they, these were tools that they, they really appreciated. And so as I mentioned at the beginning, at least I hope I did, <laughs> OER and open pedagogy are the tools that we see uh, in the OFAR program specifically to make classrooms anti-racist. And so, of course, open educational resources allow uh, changes to uh, materials to represent the voices that have been underrepresented. And the open pedagogy is that working with students so that students are collaborating on these projects. Um, and we'll give you a few examples of that in a moment, but making it student centered uh, specifically um, for students who may have been marginalized. Um, and we based some of this on some research that had, was done by Dr. Shauna Brandle out of the Kingsborough Community College, where she looked at um, American government uh, textbooks, both um, commercial and um, OER, and found that both of them included very little coverage of any historically marginalized groups. And so there was a great opportunity here for OER to be um, uh, updated and adapted. Um, looking also at science books, uh, particularly the healthcare area uh, where many of the um, images are of white skin and many of the case studies are white male focused. And we know that healthcare providers um, are not being sufficiently trained. Um, there's conditions that manifest themselves differently on dark skin and our medical uh, material is not addressing that. So another great opportunity in the STEM area. And so, um, Many of the faculty told us that anti-racism was really where uh, they felt uh, this program had its strength. Equity has been a very common uh, term used now for five or more years, and they wanted to take it further. So the Open for Anti-Racism program was all about exploring how to use OER and open pedagogy to make their uh, materials um, and teaching more anti-racist. And so they had an online workshop, which you're gonna hear about in just a moment, uh, where the culminating program was developing an action plan to work um, with their students then in the very next semester um, on, these, on this project. Um, and during this time, they benefited from peer connections, monthly webinars, coaching, and OER support that they could call on. And then we worked with the RP group uh, to document the impact through faculty surveys, interviews, and student surveys. And now I will turn this over. Oops, I just wanted to say <laughs> in the first year, we had over 300 applications and um, of just a diversity of disciplines. And we were excited to have from career technical ed right into our academic areas. And now over to, um, to Joy Shoemate, our one of our course developers. Thank you so much, Una. Uh, it is my pleasure to share with you all a bit about the course that uh, Dr. Kim Gruy and I co-developed and co-facilitated. So you will hear from Kim shortly about some of those plans and those projects that were implemented. Um, but I'm just going to spend a few moments describing a bit about 
what the four week course uh, included that our participants went through. So the program was structured um, in a way that uh, our participants, our faculty participants went through a four week uh, Canvas course. And the topics that we discussed um, were what is anti-racism, you know, what is OER, how can they be leveraged to support anti-racism, uh, same with what is open pedagogy, and then it kind of culminated with the creation of an action plan. It's important to note that our participants uh, came to us in this program with varying levels of uh, familiarity with OER and open pedagogy. So some were quite familiar and others were, these were very new concepts to them. Um, so it was really important to us that we developed a, a, a course in which um, we kind of all had a shared understanding of anti-racism and then moved through a shared understanding of how OER and open pedagogy could be leveraged to build uh, more anti-racist courses. Um, and as it says here, we also included small and large group uh, discussion so that the participants could really collaborate together and work together um, to identify some solutions and uh, ultimately work towards implementing some, some tangible changes in their courses. Next slide, please. Una. Thank you. So we started with um, you know, needing to define anti-racism and anti-racist pedagogy. Um, really, the, the purpose here, and I won't read all these words to you on the slide, but the purpose here is it, it's moving beyond um, simply incorporating racial content into, into your course, um, but it's really about reflecting on how the course content is taught and even considering what is taught. So what information are we sharing with students? Um, are we considering the ways in which our disciplines have uh, been impacted by racism? Um, who, who has even been determined to be content experts uh, in our fields? So really um, finding ways to, to really be critical of, of our own disciplines and um, what it is that we are teaching, which does require being race conscious and, and finding, um, finding ways to implement and talk about race and racism and how they impact uh, our teaching, our learning and uh, the disciplines in, in which all of our participants, our faculty are experts. Um, so I, again, as, as Una had mentioned, you know, it was really about uh, including the, the perspectives and the voices that typically are not included and in really uh, lifting those up and, sh and sharing um, the history of our disciplines and, and really validating and, and raising the voices of, of those who typically we don't hear and see uh, in our learning. Next slide, please. Right. So next it was about, okay, we have this foundation of what anti-racist pedagogy is. How do we leverage open pedagogy? How do we leverage OER to make our courses anti-racist? Um, again, won't read all of these things to you, but for example, an important um, you know, component of open pedagogy is disposable versus non-disposable assignments. So the idea that um, a disposable assignment being one in which we assign students something, a, a, a quiz, a paper, some sort of assignment, they work on it. And that's kind of where the conversation ends. Um, we just kind of wrap it up and, and we never really review it again. So again, it was this opportunity to bring our students into the learning and have the creation of, of projects and assignments where the learning continues. It doesn't have to end um, with the end of this project. So how can students see themselves as uh, being contributors to and belonging to their learning, um, being active contributors to, to the fields in which um, these courses are taking place and really um, allowing students to be, to be a part of the process where uh, it's not an assignment that just sort of ends and, and dies when the due date passes. Um, so I, again, it was really just uh, finding ways to, to leverage um, not only student contributions, but leverage the voices of those that uh, previously weren't included, even in our OER, how do we revise those and remix them to include those voices that were previously included? Next slide, please. So this was a quote from one of our faculty participants um, who shared they were interested in using open resources, um, but that uh, OFAR, this program was a, a great way to kind of link uh, anti-racist pedagogy to OER. Um, so again, it was just kind of trying to make the connection between open as a whole and anti-racism and how open 
can be leveraged to make courses anti-racist. Next slide, please. And now it is time for me to pass it over uh, to my co-facilitator and co-developer, Kim, who will tell you more um, about the action plans. Thank you, Joy. Um, I do see some questions coming up in the chat, and I definitely want to put that question from Heather Ross on hold and come back to it, please, about Indigenous voices, because it's important. But um, I do want to go ahead and do my part here, which is so exciting because I get to showcase what the um, participants in OFAR did this first round. And, um, and so that's exciting. And the, the uh, central um, activity for, for the course was to create an action plan uh, and to um, implement the, the, the activity that you came up with uh, the, that very semester, so the spring semester. And so um, we purposely made the action plan template nebulous, and there was a lot of uh, discussion about how open-ended it was and did we provide enough structure. But, you know, we walked the talk as much as we could in the course. We tried to use open pedagogical approaches whenever we could. We tried to use uh, principles, uh, universal design for learning to allow for multiple forms of engagement and expression. And so we kept it purposely ambiguous because we really wanted the participants to make these uh, plans their own that work for them, their students, and their institutions. And we did ask them to think about, okay, what are you going to do this semester with your students? And then thinking for the future, how might you um, scale this up, bring more people in, et cetera. And so with that said, um, we have a few next slide, please, to share with you from cohort one. And this is from Anna Garcia Garcia, who I believe is a coach this year. So this is a really neat thing about our program is that we uh, are, again, having students, if you will, or participants then become mentors, coaches, and lead the next group. So it's kind of an exciting feature. So Anna's project, um, she wanted to engage and empower students and open their minds to the idea of diverse science. Um, she wanted to avoid showcasing uh, white males only as role models in the course. And so she invited her students, next slide please, to create their own open scientist slide. And Anna gave guidance and they had a LibGuide. She worked with a librarian at her college and they had a LibGuide to help, but then students um, created examples of slides where there were scientists, diverse science happening and scientists who look like them. So bringing, you know, historically under uh, represented the, these contributions that aren't in the textbooks, bringing them into the science classroom. And the neat thing is then Anna will use slides that her students created during that semester, she's using them in this fall semester and so on. And so that continues to be iterative. So that's one project and one approach in a science class. Um, Deborah Crumpton, who is a business professor at Sacramento City College, um, realized that, you know, in order to do anti-racism, you got to move through the racism. And so what uh, Deborah did was to, to bring the topic into business, uh, it certainly is applicable. And yeah, next slide there. So two of the uh, activities that she did, one of them was a significantly racially minoritized entrepreneur project. And another one was uh, uh, an analysis of racial bias in marketing. And again, um, these are ways to infuse the topic into your subject area and be able to forge to uh, have discussions uh, about these types of things. The next slide, please. And, and as I said, you know, uh, Deborah realized that uh, this is ongoing work. You know, we're just kind of starting with this. You're never really finished. You know, it, it continues to evolve. And so, you know, that was one of the conclusions that Deborah came to. And uh, I think she's a coach this year, too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is Oliver Rosales from Bakersfield Community College. And uh, Oliver is a, uh, an historian and a history professor. And his uh, exciting project, um, he calls it radical archiving. And, and, and what that simply means is he helps his students realize and understand that their histories, their families, their communities are what make up the history of the place. And so his project uh, brings uh, student voice uh, and lived experiences and lives and families and communities into the history of California and uh, showcases this in a fantastic um, uh, a website, which again, you, got, uh, you all will get, um, excuse me, you all will have access to slides and links and resources. So you can look at these you know, more closely. I know you want to. Uh, next slide, please. 
And this is Nakia Cheney, English professor at Cabrillo College. And um, she created a, uh, and this again is available in the commons. And I noticed some, some people commented on um, our O4 course. They, they are available in the commons. Uh, there are links in these presentations. And as Una noted in the, the um, OE Global uh, CCC OER OFAR website. But this final one is so exciting because um, first of all, uh, Nakia created a module on a topic again, related to anti-racism, bringing in the topic to her college classroom and then allow her students to explore this and express themselves uh, on the topic in ways that really work for them. But the most exciting thing about this one um, is that Nakia herself realized that she was kind of putting her story in the margins, you know, and what she realized is that she could sort of center her story a little bit. It was a way to connect with her students. And so uh, making these personal connections, um, I think are important for, for students in their learning. So, so those are some of the exciting projects. And then the next slide, as we referenced um, before, you, there is both a facilitated version. And again, Joy and I, um, created that originally, and she and I also uh, facilitated uh, that particular four-week version. And there's a self-paced version too, where we created a few self-check quizzes and whatnot that you could sort of use for your own self-edification or in some other way in, in programs at your college uh, with faculty development, et cetera. So those are just some of the exciting projects from OFAR part one that i um, so grateful I got to share that with you all today. Great, thank you, Kim. Next slide, thanks. And then we have a quote for another quote from one of our faculty participants. Learning from my peers was great. There were faculty, there were other faculty that teach such, such an array of different disciplines and seeing how they use anti-racism in their curriculum really inspired me. Uh, so certainly uh, learning from their peers was one of, the, one of the top points of feedback that we received from our, from our participants. Uh, next slide, please, Una. So in addition to the uh, facilitated Canvas course that Joy and, and Kim created and facilitated and the connection with their peers and the connection with coaches and mentors, uh, we provided support in other ways. Uh, for example, we provided uh, a series of workshops on a lot of the OER nuts and bolts, uh, searching for OER licensing attributions, Q&A sessions, uh, all facilitated by our small but mighty OER staff here at College of the Canyons. Uh, and we hosted a series of monthly webinars throughout the spring term of last year, uh, featuring primarily experts in anti-racism uh, and, and anti-racist pedagogy, sharing their knowledge and their perspectives. So uh, a lot of ongoing support for our participants during the same time that they were implementing these changes in their classes. Next slide, please. Uh, and I wanna also speak a, a bit about our research uh, research wraparound to, to the OFAR project. It was very, it's very important to us to uh, really document what we're doing because essentially we're, we're going into this, uh, you know, as, as, as many of you as, as experienced folks in open education, uh, wanting to see really can anti-racist instructional materials uh, and teaching practices impact the success and retention of different student populations. Um, how do participating students perceive differences in the classroom? And you know, for us, can open pedagogy be used as a tool in all disciplines? Does it lend itself better to other disciplines? And the, the satisfaction question is always present. Do participating faculty recommend open pedagogy as an anti-racism tool? Next slide, please. Uh, throughout the program, we, uh, we engage an outside third party uh, evaluation organization named uh, the RP group, the research and planning group, which is really the, the premier uh, research organization that works with California Community Colleges. Uh, they uh, uh, worked with our faculty participants. They administered pre-surveys, post-surveys, interviews, a lot of, uh, and you can find all this documented on our website. Um, uh, we documented the number of students who were impacted, uh, students uh, in participating classes completed surveys, a post survey on their perceptions in the differences between the courses they were enrolled in and previous uh, experiences in that institution. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the students uh, noted uh, when asked to describe an assignment that supported learning, 
uh, noted the racial assignment because it brought to brought a real life problem into our learning and made it more interesting to learn, right? That's what we all want. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the students told us, the students who were surveyed uh, as part of this uh, part of this research, 88% uh, told us that they felt more engaged or more active. 87% uh, said they always, almost always had opportunities to provide their own perspectives. 92% said almost always they examined the history of their discipline, going back to what Joy shared with us about the definition of anti-racist pedagogy. And 83% uh, said they, they almost always use classroom content to identify challenges and biases. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic responses from the students, really uh, hard, hard to believe. Um, next slide, please. Go right ahead, Linda. Thank you. Um, faculty. Uh, when we asked faculty and uh, documented the impact with faculty um, on the on the left hand side of the screen, teaching practices. Eighty eight percent of the participants. So that's every everybody except one uh, really uh, said that they incorporated student voice. It, that that's just remarkable. And I should say, as an aside, the open pedagogy piece is what really wowed I think the participants the most. Uh, even more than the idea of remixing a, a textbook. 89% uh, said they engage students to co-create anti-racism modules. And then down at the bottom, this is kind of interesting, fewer uh, noted that they implemented inclusive images and materials and fewer noted that they in, engaged in explicit conversations about race. So those are some findings that we want to uh, explore further. We will say that some of our participants said that they got pushback from some of their students when they when they uh, introduced the assignments that were explicitly addressing race. Um, whoops, if we can go back a couple of slides. There we go, stop there, thank you. Um, uh, also, 94% uh, said that they had an increased understanding of anti-racist teaching practice. 81% said their knowledge of OER went up. 87% said their knowledge of open pedagogy went up. So all kinds of great things happening. Next slide, please, Una. Thank you. Uh, and I won't read all of these, but suffice it to say, every, every, almost everybody who participated in the program said they'd do it again. They'd recommend it to, to, their, to their colleagues, uh, which is just fantastic. But look down on the bottom left, 60% said, well, engaging in explicit conversations about race, you were identified that as something that they plan to continue. So again, that's something that we want to tease out a bit more, uh, probably through interviews this year. Uh, and the next slide, we're ready for the next slide. Thank you, Una. Uh, so we we have uh, concluded, we concluded last year the, what we termed a pilot program. Uh, uh, and thanks again to the support of the Hewlett Foundation and the great Thoughtner partner, thought partnership of Angela DeBarger with the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, we are able to expand the program this year. Uh, last year, we recruited individual faculty members uh, from different colleges all over this massive state. We have 115 community colleges um, and we've received 330 applications for 17 spots. Uh, this year, uh, we want to uh, see what kind of an impact we can have on a deeper basis within institutions. So we requested applications from teams from institutions, uh, teams comprised of four, five, six faculty members from a single institution. Um, we have the capacity to take eight teams uh, and we received 68 applications. So still quite a, a large demand out there for folks to participate, which is heartwarming, right? How wonderful that so many people wanna, wanna get involved in this work and do this work. Um, in addition, this year, working with our researchers, we're going to uh, try to measure the change in student outcomes over time so that participants uh, institutional research teams will be providing student outcome data from previous the previous three years that our participants were teaching. Then outcomes data from the semester in which the intervention is taking place and the sem semester after the inter intervention has been introduced. So we're, we're, we're aiming to get a longitudinal look at the changes that occurred. We're really, really excited about that and seeing what, what we can get out of that. Uh, next slide, please. There's our contact information. I'll leave that up just for a second, but then we'll go to the very final slide and turn it over to all of you. Uh, we've got some time left for discussion, which is fantastic. Uh, you and see as, 
Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Kim. Well, as promised, I just want to come back to Heather's question, Heather Ross's mm -hmm. question about were there indigenous voices in the course? And I think Joy would like to speak to that. Oh, sure. Yes. Um, well, Heather, in, in response to your question, thank you for asking about indigenous voices. Um, we were really excited. Two of our faculty participants uh, in particular um, really wanted to honor and, and take a deeper dive into focusing on indigenous voices. Uh, one instructor happened, uh, happens to be in uh, ESL, English as a Second Language instructor. So really kind of um, it was very interesting to read her work about really breaking down the whole construct of language and um, and and taking a look at um, you know how we have constructed that over time. Um, so she took a real deep dive. And then uh, the other project that um, Kim shared, which was um, Oliver's um, history project. So in, including students um, to actually tell the history of, of their, um, the area in which their college is, is located. Um, so those were two examples of some specific projects in which, um, you know, again, the, the faculty were leading the, those, those projects and they uh, intended to look more specifically and kind of really focus in on uh, indigenous voices and the impact of, of those indigenous voices, not only on their disciplines, but um, the impact uh, on their students as well. So hope that answered it. And uh, James, I apologize. Well, I think we, <laughs> you were gonna facilitate the discussion. No, so. no, well, and I, James, can I just say one more thing about the chat? Someone, a cable actually asked, and I thought it was a great question, wondering if there is anybody in this space right now who is K-12 and planning to take some of this work to the K-12. I thought that was a really good question, or if anybody wanted to speak to, to K-12 before we kind of move on with this. Thanks, Kim, for that. Um, I, I don't think that we've touched base with K through 12 on this particular topic. Obviously, we do, um, you know, speak with K through 12 around um, the dual enrollment situation um, and, and the opportunity there for open educational resources. So we pretty regularly have conversations on that topic. But yeah, this, that's a really good point. And then I do see that Ethan, uh, one of our colleagues in here, Ethan uh, Senek, and uh, tomorrow, that group is presenting about the K-12 space. So oh, wonderful. shout out to Ethan and the gang and there me. for that. And, yeah. and I think and I think there is a session today oh. actually um, at uh, 1245, creating OER for racial equity and social justice through inclusive innovation, which is focused on K-12. So, so much goodness at this conference. Uh, do we have any other, uh, other questions in the chat that we want to address? <laughs> um, I saw that in the, in the chat two questions. Are you planning on having a future call for 2022? Do applicants need to be from the CCC OER institutions? Well, okay, so I'll, I'll answer that one. Uh, in uh, this year and last year, we focused on the California Community College system, um, but we have had a lot of interest from outside. So that's something we're looking at. Um, seeing if we could support people outside of the state of California. And those who are in California are not required to be CCCOER members, although our chancellor's office is a member of CCCOER. So technically all of the colleges are. Yeah, and, and if I could add to that as well, thanks, Una. Uh, uh, yes, we've been incredibly uh, excited and, and flattered to receive lots of interest from outside the California community colleges and outside of California. Uh, if, if you're with an organization that would like to have a conversation, we're very, very open to conversations, but we haven't figured out how to do it yet. So, uh, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, uh, we don't have an answer or a, a template as to how to, to, to transfer this with the numbers, because it's off, often is a matter of funding, uh, but we'd love to have that conversation. Absolutely. Uh, and on that note, we should we should also note, uh, we, we didn't, did not explicitly state this. One of the features of the program is that the faculty receive a modest stipend for their participation. Uh, we think it's important to honor their labor, honor their work. Uh, they are dedicating significant time to this process, uh, so they, they, we are honoring that, that labor through their through a through a, a modest stipend. Thank you, James. And I just wanted to um, emphasize one of the Diana. Um, and let me see if I, Diana Vera Alba, who is at uh, San Diego Community College Extension, they're currently um, 
running the program uh, with a small group of them in the San Diego district. Um, so that's exciting to see them using the Canvas Commons course uh, to, to, uh, to run their own little uh, small group. And I don't know if Diana, if you want to, would we be open to letting, Diana, you could un, unmute yourself and uh, if you'd like to share a few words. Sure. Hi, Una. Thank you so much. Um, this is the second time I go through this presentation. And of course, every time you learn a little bit more. So thank you very much. Um, yes, we, uh, we have a small group um, going through the self-paced modules, and we're still trying to, um, we're in week two, and we're still trying to develop a goal for it. Part of it is student-based, which is what must, which is what this is geared for, but we also want to incorporate something that's faculty-based, meaning, and I, I wrote my um, question in the chat, if there's something that addresses anti-racism among family, uh, faculty, and I'm not saying that we have a racist faculty, but I think that sometimes um, we forget about ourselves and there are um, there are things that are maybe said or done that may be offensive to others and we just don't realize it. So, so that is what I'm, we are looking for in this small group. Of course, it's student centered um, and the what we're thinking about, but that conversation came up in our small group. Like, how do we present this to faculty and make it also about faculty without offending anyone? <laughs> but just yeah. the awareness, I guess, the awareness. Thank you for that, Diana. And of course, you're you're going in there kind of as a train the trainer model um, because right. yeah, the faculty in, in our program, obviously they're they're right in the program. So that is a, yeah, it's an interesting question on how to use that. And I'm gonna let Kim and Joy respond if they'd like to. It's kind of a use of the program that, that not exactly the way it was designed, but it's exciting to see it. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap. And I know we only have two minutes, but on my team at uh, where I work at Northern Virginia, we recently, you know, in the last year hired a, a, a gender fluid person to be on our team. And that alone, you know, has been the catalyst for us to grow as a team in that way and to have the conversations. And I just want to say, Diane, you said without offending anybody. I don't know about that. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, we can be respectful and whatnot, but some people are more ready than others and some people may get offended. And we just have to, we, we talk a lot, no far about being uncomfortable and having uncomfortable conversations. And, uh, and we work hard to create the space to do that. So if you are going to do it with faculty, the only thing I would recommend is, you know, kind of following through on that community agreements and setting up the parameters by which your group uh, can work together uh, to grow in that way. So thank you for that great question. Joy, do you want to add something? Well, actually, Kim, you just you just touched on it. I was going to say, um, you know, perhaps utilizing um, some of the activities that we implemented in, in the course for use with faculty. So those community agreements. So that could be used like department wide where everyone comes together to uh, work together to, to build um, how I don't want to call them rules of engagement, but how will, will this department engage collectively? How will we respect the space? How will we lean into these difficult conversations, um, which really can apply even amongst faculty? And we hoped, you know, obviously, as, as Una was saying, the course was built for um, with the intention of being utilized in, in a classroom environment. But certainly you could use those strategies amongst peers, if you will, to um, Kind of set the stage for for a positive way of at least engaging in those conversations. I, I think that would be a good, perhaps a strategy that's that's worth trying. Thank you. Okay, and we're getting the getting the cut sign from our very nice <laughs> hostess here. Thank you, Amelia. So and, yeah, and, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, we, we are out of time and we'll need to end the session. So I'm going to stop recording. This was a really great session and I think a very fruitful, interesting, important one. And you are welcome to stay behind and continue the conversation if you would like. Thank you.